it didn't take long for me to go from being an addicted ICU RN to an incarcerated individual that had a three to 10 year prison sentence ahead of him. In this video, I'm gonna share the story of what happened between these two events. But real quick, if you're new here, I'm Brian, a once trauma ICU RN turned full-time heroin and meth addict, arrested for selling drugs, serving out the rest of my three to 10 year prison sentence on house arrest. On this channel, I share with you my personal journey and what it's been like for me to become sober. And I'm actively rebuilding my life from scratch as I go along. So welcome. I recently posted a video called My Final Days as an Addicted ICU Nurse. If you haven't seen that video yet, I recommend you go check it out first so you can get some context for this one. Also, I'm making this video in response to some questions I was getting in the comments regarding my arrest. These questions are summed up nicely by one commenter, uh, MS Rotor Wings. I hope I'm saying that right. Hey Brian, thanks for sharing. Have you done a video on what led up to your arrest? The arrest and going to county jail. Can you share more about your B felony? I'm glad you have a YouTube channel. You never know who's listening and who you are reaching. This closing our secrets help mitigate the shame. I love that. Thank you so much for that comment. Here's another comment from MS Rotor Wings. Hey Brian, can you share why you were convicted instead of being given diversion? This is with regard to the Board of Nursing's program. Uh, if you're caught diverting meds, which means taking meds and, and you know taking them for yourself, you can be offered a diversion program that allows you to keep your license and you go through this uh, whole process. This is a really good question and it made me realize that I hadn't really clarified this yet in my past videos. My getting in trouble with the law had nothing to do with my nursing practice or my nursing career. So I'm going to talk about in this video what did happen and what did lead to my arrest. Okay, so to pick up where the last video ended, I had unknowingly worked my final days as an ICU RN and then I had been reluctantly dragged off to rehab by my friends and family. Although I had been offered the diversion program by the Board of Nursing after I'd been caught with that dirty hair test, the rehab that I was dragged off to was not the diversion program. It didn't have anything to do with my nursing license. My family just felt that it was like an emergency and they needed to get me to rehab as quickly as possible. So they just found the best one they could find and got me admitted. The rehab that I was dropped off at was a 90 day inpatient rehab. I got there, I went through a detox period. While I was in the detox period, I remember having to go down and get access to a phone so that I could call my recruiter for my travel nursing assignments and cancel the contract on her. No notice. I remember I hated doing that because I was just, I don't know if anyone's ever gone through withdrawal and you just feel terrible and you don't, you can't deal with anything. And I just remember that was such a dreadful thing <laughs> to do when I was in that state. I was withdrawing from heroin and meth, by the way. So I went through this 90 day rehab. I completed it. And by the end, when I got out, I was feeling really good about being off of drugs and I was feeling really confident and I wanted to get back home so that I could show everybody how good I was doing and that I had changed. And as I mentioned in the last video, this turns out not to be a very sustainable way to, to approach your sobriety because my motivation was really coming from a place of wanting validation from other people, which is totally understandable because you've been screwing up and screwing up the lives of the people around you for so long that you want to be better for them. I also had all this energy and enthusiasm just from being freshly sober because it was like novel to me. And I was like, I'm gonna show up and I'm gonna show everybody how good I'm doing, I'm gonna do everything for everybody, anybody who needs anything, I'm gonna be there for them, I'm gonna help out here, I'm gonna help out here, and I'm so good, I'm never going back to drugs. This is called the pink cloud. Being sober is still fresh and new, so you're like riding on this wave of novelty. So at this time, as I talked about in the last video, my nursing license was under investigation from the Board of Nursing because I had failed a pre-employment hair follicle drug test, and even though I had just done the three-month inpatient rehab, that it wasn't the diversion program that the Board of Nursing offered, so they weren't accounting that for anything. So my license was still under investigation, but it was still unaffected at this time as the investigation continued. It just so happened that the rehab that I had gone to down in the Bay Area in California had another location, and that location was in South Lake Tahoe, which was like just a few miles from my house there. And knowing that I had just completed their three-month program and that I had a nursing license, they contacted me because they were looking for a nurse to start working at the location in Tahoe right next to my house. I ended up accepting this job offer and I wound up working there as their in-house 
nurse. This would be the last time I was ever employed as an RN. Working there was a lot. It was like 10 hour days, five days a week. They had me doing all kinds of stuff outside of just nursing duties. I was like doing transport for them for back and forth from like the Bay Area picking up people. I was doing all kinds of paperwork and stuff, just not like the job that I was used to at all. And over the next couple months at this place, the pink cloud kind of started to fade away. Long story short, I ended up relapsing. And once I had relapsed, I was kind of looking for an excuse to leave. I think that I talked to them about it or I failed a drug test with them or something. And then they confronted me about it and were like very kind. They offered to help me. They said I could go kind of work the program a little bit more and then come back and still have a job and all this stuff. And at that point, I think I remember I was just like, no man, I'm done. I, I don't want to be here anymore. At some point, my wife found out that I had relapsed again and that was kind of it for her. Um, if you want to hear about everything that she went through, make sure you go check out that last video. But at this point, she was like, I think it's time for a divorce. And I think I agreed. I think I might've put up a little bit of a fight at the end after agreeing, but ultimately, we both knew that this was, this was it. At this point, I moved out of our house in Tahoe and I bought a camper van. It looks like this. And I just moved into that thing and then just drove down to <laughs> Reno and started running around there because that's where I knew where to get drugs. And I just started kind of living out of this camper van and just doing drugs all the time. At this point, I had just forgotten about the investigation on my nursing license. I like actually to this day, I've just for, I forgot about it. I never looked back. I assumed that my nursing license got revoked, obviously, because I just wasn't around to respond to any of their letters or to, to, see, to see how it was going. I just lost complete interest in it. All I was interested in was just living day by day and getting high. This is the part of the story where I got involved in selling drugs. And I'm gonna tell you about how that developed. When you're running around on the street trying to get high on illegal drugs, you kind of just take whatever you can get. And that's a really dangerous situation to be in because you never know what you're actually getting. This is a huge part of why people overdose and die so much because they're doing drugs and injecting drugs even into their veins that they don't really know what's in it. But like I said, when you're desperate to get high, you're gonna take whatever you can get and just take that risk. It's a really sad and crazy state to, to find yourself in. But this is what I was doing. I was just finding whatever I could find, but who I could find it from was very inconsistent. You know, I could never get it from the same person all the time. I would get stuff that was really questionable of what it was. I was getting ripped off all the time and I was just living kind of day to day trying to find whatever I could to get me through that day. At one point, I found through a friend, somebody in California who had a consistent supply of stuff that he tested, he didn't use himself, and he was just a seller and he tested it and he was uh, and he was really particular about the quality of the stuff he was getting. And I got connected up with this guy. The thing is, he didn't sell just little amounts. He only sold like large amounts. So at that point, instead of continuing to scramble around on the streets to get whatever I can and to be getting ripped off all the time and to be getting stuff that I didn't even know what it was and paying these really high prices for it, I scraped together as much money as I could to buy from this guy. I would drive my van to California pick up this heroin from him and then come back to Reno where I was kind of staying. And this solved this problem. This stuff was available all the time. It was consistent. It was the same thing every time. He actually wouldn't even sell to me. He would get stuff sometimes and wouldn't sell it to me because he was like, this stuff isn't as good as of quality. This isn't, there's some fentanyl in this. You know, I don't feel comfortable selling it. And, and you're gonna have to wait until I get another shipment or whatever. Back in Reno, in this community of users that I was associated with now, everybody had had this problem that I was talking about where they, you know, there was nobody they could find that had anything that was reliable or that they knew was, you know, any kind of level of quality. So when the word kind of got out that I had, you know, plenty of this stuff that was good and consistent, people started coming and wanting it all the time. And I needed a way to continue to be able to afford it, so I started selling it to, to people who, who, who wanted it. And I was selling it for cheaper than anybody else was selling this crazy questionable stuff for anyway, so naturally, 
I became pretty popular, I guess, with, with, this, with this consistent supply. So I wasn't like aspiring to be a drug dealer or anything. I just wanted to keep doing heroin. And this seemed like the most logical, safest way to do it. Anyway, so I was doing this for months. And during that time, there are so many crazy things that happened. I mean, I'm talking like there were times when cars were stolen and we had to chase people down and there was a time when I was held at gunpoint and robbed and there's just like so many crazy stories that I will get into at some point on this channel. But to make a long story short, what ended up happening is somebody who had been a regular buyer from me got caught with some stuff that they had on them and in order to get out of trouble, they agreed to tell the cops where they were getting it from, and that was me. They were told that they could act as a confidential informant and let the cops know where they could find me and when they could find me with the most stuff. So they told the cops when I was coming back from California into Nevada, when I had just gotten more supply, and as soon as I crossed the border one day coming back, I got pulled over and uh, searched and arrested. After that arrest, I spent seven days withdrawing in county jail until some people that I was running around with bailed me out. So I got out actually after that seven days and went back to doing the same thing that I was doing. Obviously the cops were watching me closely at that time, but I was just so high and I'd never been involved in any criminal activity before. So I just was completely like, just stupid and oblivious to anything that was going on. And I just continued doing what I was doing. Um, I stopped riding around in my van to go get drugs. That's about it. <laughs> but I still lived in my van. And about three or four weeks later, that same confidential informant who I didn't know was working with the cops was persuaded to do a controlled buy on me. So she came and bought some drugs and then uh, you know, that she was miked or whatever and that she, the whole thing was, was, was documented and then they re-arrested me again and that's when I was incarcerated for the long haul. I was ultimately sentenced to three to ten years for drug trafficking because I was coming across the border that first time and sales because they got me set on that controlled buy for the second one and that's the rest is history. I've been in prison or jail or on house arrest ever since. And it's been almost three years since that happened. FYI, pro tip, if the cops ever come to you and say, if you help us out, we'll help you out and we're gonna keep your identity confidential, um, that is BS, man. It was so easy for me to find out who it was that did this. Like, I absolutely have no hard feelings towards this person at all. I completely understand why they did what they did. But just so you know, when they tell you that your identity is gonna be kept confidential, don't listen, it's bullshit. When I was in jail, I requested my discovery, it's called, which is all my paperwork on my arrest, and all of the reports were written out there, and just wherever this person's name was, it just said confidential informant instead. But the whole story is listed there, and I could read it, and I was there, so I know who it was. So just keep that in mind. So that's the story of what went down from nursing to prison for me. One thing I do wanna talk about real quick that came up in the comments is that in another video I mentioned that my my crime is a victimless nonviolent drug offense. And this person in the comments, uh, Louisa D93, uh, thank you for your comment. I think this is a really good comment and a really good point. They said, well, selling drugs isn't victimless. You have no way of knowing whether that one dose will end someone or do harm. Louisa also follows this up with very kind and encouraging words. So I'm not trying to point this out as like a negative comment at all. This is a good point. I just want to clarify that when I say that my crime is a victimless crime, what I mean is that technically it's considered victimless because there were no individual victims in my case. I don't pay restitution to anyone particularly. There was nobody that was like assaulted or anything like that. So there's no individual victims in, in the case itself. So that's just a technical reference to the name of my crime, which is victimless nonviolent drug offense. But I completely take Luisa's point and I'm actually still conflicted to this day about this. And I think it's due to like seeing the humanity and the reality of drug use on the ground level and going through that experience. It makes me realize how messy and tricky the war on drugs really is. And what really drives this point home is the fact that after I was arrested, when I was in county jail, through phone calls that I made to people on the outside that I was using with, 
they reported to me that after that supply that I had brought back was gone because I wasn't doing it anymore, there were several people who had been buying for me who had gone back to buying on the streets and just getting this random stuff that they didn't know what it was, and several of them overdosed in the weeks after I was arrested. Now, I'm definitely not saying that I was doing something altruistic or anything. I was just trying to get high and I was trying to stay high. So that was my mindset. But I'm, I'm just, I still don't know how to feel about that now. And maybe you guys can help me out. Like, I would love to hear your thoughts on this kind of messy issue, you know? I mean, the people that I was selling to were people who were using already, and there were lots of people who were overdosing already, and when I had this supply of drugs, they were coming to me and like so thankful and relieved that they could have a, a source of something where, you know, they could connect with somebody who wasn't trying to sell them crap, it wasn't trying to overcharge them, and was just bringing consistent you know, reliable stuff, and as dangerous and horrible as doing these drugs are in the first place, it seemed like the best thing that I could do at the time when I was in that situation. Like, again, I wasn't trying to, I wasn't like actually trying to like do good or anything, but this was just, it makes me th like reflect on the whole situation and how, and how just messy and, and weird it is. And I don't even know how to feel about it. I feel like I should feel guilty for, for selling drugs, but I, but I don't know how to process it is what I'm saying. And um, I, would love to, I would love to hear anyone's thoughts on that. All right, thank you guys so much for watching. The song of the week this week is Zan Fiskum. Forest Fire. This is an artist that was introduced to me by a good friend of mine who actually happens to be the bass player in the video that I'm linking in the description to this song. It blew me away. She is awesome. Her voice is so perfect and yet so raw at the same time. I absolutely freaked out when I heard this and I love it and I really uh, hope you go check it out. She also has some other cool stuff that is, is really cool to listen to if you want to branch out with her. One last thing I want to mention for the regular viewers. I usually post these videos on Sunday. That's when my regular posting is. I'm actually moving that to Monday. So I'm gonna start only posting on Monday. My days off of the week of work are Sunday and Monday. So it just gives me a little bit more time to edit the videos and take a little bit more time creating them. So from now on, I believe I'm gonna be posting on Monday instead of Sunday. And that's it. I'll see you guys next week.